we have been going through, first we went through the book of Galatians, and we finished that, and then we have started through Romans. And uh, there is quite a um, connection between the two. And now we've finished the first five chapters of Romans, so I would like to go back and just give you a slight summary of the earlier chapters. Paul's letter to the Romans, or rather to those that had become Christians at Rome, they were not necessarily all Romans, was written, of course, long before he himself went there. He went there much, much later. But uh, the first chapter, he addresses to those who had been Romans, and of course it's all to those who were converted. For example, he addresses the first chapter, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, and so on. He tells all the introductory part before he gets to the salutation of who it's to, to whom. Let's see. Verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So he, he is talking to those that had been converted at Rome, but they had been Romans, you see, and uh, consequently the Romans fancied that they were intellectual. They looked down on Jewish Christians because the Jews had considered that they were superior because they had the law of God. But uh, the Romans considered that they were superior to the Jews because they had knowledge and uh, they didn't necessarily regard uh, the Mosaic law of great importance anyway because in their conversion they hadn't been taught that we have to obey the rituals and the uh, the physical rituals and sacrifices of the Mosaic law, but only the spiritual phases. And so uh, Paul's opening chapter is correcting the Romans of how when they had known about God, the Romans generally, not just the Christians, but the Romans anciently, they uh, had not regarded him as God, and how they had withheld the truth when they got any of it from the people, and uh, how they had, uh, in their intellectuality, by denying God, uh, they had become fools. They had not retained God in their knowledge, and consequently, they had gone over into every licentious thing imaginable, and uh, he was calling them down, that they... They were not uh, so wise and so high up on the ladder as they seemed to think they were. Then the second chapter, he addresses more to the Jewish Christians who happened to be at Rome. Now, they prided themselves as being superior to the Romans because they had the law of God. And uh, so he says that you feel you're superior because you have the law, but you yourself don't obey the law. So then, from that time on, he gets to talking along that line. Now, we need to know that the earliest opposition to the gospel came from unconverted Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Christ. Now, uh, they were not converted. So much of the earliest preaching that we find recorded in the Bible, in the book of Acts, and then even the letters of Paul, if he covers that part of it, was testimony by the twelve apostles of the resurrection of Christ proving he was the Messiah. You see, they had spent three and a half years with Jesus, day in and day out, day and night, you might say, and they had been instructed by him. Then they had spent 40 days with him after his resurrection. So they were eyewitnesses. And it was just like in a jury trial, where you call on eyewitnesses, which is the strongest proof you can get, I suppose. And uh, they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. So uh, a lot of people think they were preaching about Christ 
instead of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that is not true. They, they, much of their early preaching to unconverted Jews, hoping that some of them would be converted, was their eyewitness testimony that uh, Jesus was the true Messiah and that they were responsible for his death. But then we come to another place where they are talking to those who had been converted. Now, those who had been Jews and were converted still were following on something that the Jews had had. Now, the pagan religions did not have any of the doctrine that the Christian religion had in the uh, area of uh, the forgiveness of sin how that Christ's death forgives our sin. The pagans instead had a system of self-punishment, self-inflicted punishment that uh, they felt would equal, by punishing themselves, that the pain and everything would equal the uh, evil that they had done and square it up. Now, it wouldn't, because all of the self-punishment in the world isn't going to get away. Sin is against God. And you punishing yourself doesn't please God one way or the other or make you any better in God's sight. But uh, they didn't know God, and that's the way they looked at it. Now, what they did then, the Jews borrowed the principle of this very thing from the Gentiles. For example, one thing that I just call to mind uh, that the Gentiles would do, they would take a long plank and drive nails into it, sticking up, and then turn it down so that the nails were sticking up and have to walk over that barefooted on those nails. And of course, it would just go right and uh, cut through to the bone, and it would be a very painful thing. But they would uh, have that self-inflicted torture to square up their sins. Now... After the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, there was a colony sent back to Jerusalem to build the second temple. It was only part of the Jews, and the Jews were only part of Israel. The whole nation of Israel had been divided way back uh, almost 1,000 years before Christ and had been divided into two nations. It was right after the death of Solomon. And uh, the northern kingdoms rejected uh, Rehoboam, the king, who was the son of Solomon and the grandson of David. And uh, they set up uh, Jeroboam as their king, and they made their capital at Samaria, which is up north of Jerusalem. Well, then Judah separated from them in order to keep the king Rehoboam. And... Uh, Benjamin stayed with Judah, and the first thing that uh, Jeroboam, now king up at Samaria, the first thing he did when Israel made him king was to change the feasts of the seventh month to the eighth month. Now, it isn't stated in the Bible, but uh, by putting what is stated in the Bible together, a little bit of putting two and two together, is strongly implied that he also changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to the day after, since the Sabbath is the seventh, a lot of times they call Sunday the eighth day, although it's also the first day of the week because we begin counting the days of the week all over again with Sunday. And that is where Sunday began. And that was way back a thousand years before Christ. That began in Israel. Now, the nation Israel had never been called Jews. Jew is a nickname for the tribe Judah. Now, the next thing that uh, Jeroboam did was to put the uh, Levites out of the ministry. They were the priests of the nation, all the born Levites, and uh, they were the highest educated. And they did not farm or work to produce a living, but they lived on the tithes of the people. Now, since they were one of the small tribes, and uh, Joseph had the two tribes of uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, 
that means that there had been 12 other tribes, uh, nearly all of which were a lot larger in number of people than uh, Levi. And uh, the result is the Levites had about two and a half or three or three and a half times the income, which we would use money as an exchange today, and we'd say two or three, uh, three and a half times the amount of income or money that the others in Israel had. They were also the highest educated and the better, had the better minds and the better training. And uh, Jeroboam deposed them and put the lowest and most ignorant of the people in the priesthood. Well, the result is that practically all, and maybe all, I don't know, but it was all or most all, of the Levites went down to join with the, the tribe of Judah, and that became then not the kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of Judah, which consisted of three tribes now, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They were called the Jews. Never was the big nation of the te other ten tribes ever called Jews. The first place that the word Jews occurs in the Bible, Second Kings 16, verse 6, you will find that Israel was at war against the Jews. And today people think that all Israelites were called Jews, and that is not true at all. People just don't understand the Bible because apparently they don't read it. They read a verse here and a verse there once in a while, but they read it out of context and don't know what is before it and after it, and they get all mixed up. Now, after... Judah was taken captive from 721 to 718 B.C. and taken away from that land as slaves over into Assyria. And within a hundred years, the Assyrians with them had migrated north and west, or northwest. And the Assyrians settled down in the land that we call Germany today, both east and west Germany. Now Germany is divided, and part of it is under the Soviet Union. But uh, the Germans are merely the descendants of ancient Assyria. Not Syria, but Assyria. And uh, the uh, ten tribes of the Israelites kept going on farther west and settled in France and Belgium and uh, Holland and Denmark, and Sweden, and Norway, and in England, and Britain. Now, in the meantime, I told you that Jeroboam, the first king, after they rejected Rehoboam, had changed from the seventh to the eighth day. The seventh day, Sabbath, God had made a sign between him and Israel, a sign if you see a sign hung out and it says Smith and Company Furniture or H. Jones and Son Drugs, you know the sign identifies. It tells you what it is, what kind of a store, who owns it, and it's a means of identification. The Sabbath is a means of identification. It tells Israel who God is because... In six days, God did the creating of this world as it is today, and uh, of all plants and animals and people and so on. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now also, it identifies who are the people of God, because they are the only people, the only nation who ever kept Sabbath on Saturday as the Sabbath. No other nation does, and no other nation ever did as a nation. So it was a sign. Why do people think the Jews are all there is of Israel? Because they've kept the Sabbath. I don't mean they keep it like they should, but at least they keep it in name, and they don't reject it. And that identifies them as being the people of God. And if Israel had kept it, they would have never lost their identity. But they got into speaking a different language as soon as they were taken to Assyria. And by the second and third generation, they weren't speaking Hebrew anymore. And uh, so they lost, and they got to thinking they were Gentiles. They didn't even know who they were. 
And the world doesn't know to this day who they are or where they are. That's one thing that no church, but our church understands that truth. And yet it's plain in the Bible. And my uh, book on that will soon be printed as a book in bookstores all over. Well, now, 70 years after the Jews, or Judah, had been taken, uh, been invaded by Babylon, and uh, Babylon had won that war, and took them as captive away from Judah and over to Babylon as slaves. Seventy years later, the Persian Empire had succeeded Babylon, and uh, now the king of Persia was in charge, and uh, God moved on him through the spirit that was in him, to have a certain number of Jews sent back to form a colony in Jerusalem to build a second temple. Because between 604 and 585 B.C., the king of Babylon had completely destroyed the uh, temple that Solomon had built at Jerusalem. And there wasn't even one stone left on top of another. And uh, it was just totally gone. So a group went back under a man who was named Zerubbabel. He was the governor. Along with him was, uh, see, was he a high priest, uh, Joshua? And uh, then about the same time also came the two uh, prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, Ezra and Nehemiah each wrote a book in the Bible, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, and uh, the book of Haggai, and uh, the fourth part of the book of Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament, give all of the history about this colony of Jews, which is only part of the Jews now. And the Jews are only part of all Israel. And... Uh, it tells about them. Now, after them, about a generation or two later, remember, they went back there about 515 B.C., 515 years before, approximately, before the birth of Christ. And uh, a generation or two later, the Jewish rabbis in this colony began to take the physical laws, the rituals, the ceremonial law of just the physical things to do morning, noon, and night that were in the law of Moses as a temporary substitute till the Holy Spirit should come, and also the animal sacrifices, which were a temporary substitute until Christ would come and become the Lamb of God and be slain. And they made... Those things, that is especially the ritual law, they made that their means of self-punishment to expiate their sins. In other words, instead of taking a plank and walking on nails, sticking straight up in it, uh, and punish yourself, now you had to obey the, this ritual law, which was very difficult and things you had to do every day, and uh, that that would justify your sins. In other words, to justify is to, well, really, you could say forgive is what it means, but technically it means to make just or uh, wipe out the penalty so that uh, that's all that hangs over you is the penalty of what is passed. So, now, the Jews... The early Jews that were converted in the early years wanted to keep all those ritual laws, and they wanted to get justified, whereas the Apostle Paul is teaching, as the Apostles all did, that we are justified of past guilt because Christ paid the penalty in our stead. And his shed blood, of course, he died by shedding his blood, and uh, the blood is the life, and when the blood's gone out of your body, you're dead, that's all. So that uh, they looked on that as the means of justification. Now, in Romans, Paul then, uh, after showing how the Jews 
had prided themselves on having the law. Now he's still talking to converted Jews, and a lot of them now wanted to keep that ritualistic law, which was a physical law and not the spiritual law of the Ten Commandments. The spiritual law is one word, love. But it is outgoing love in concern for the welfare of others. It's love toward God and love to neighbors. It's not incoming lust, but outflowing love. God is love, and love just flows out from God. God isn't trying to get anything from us one way or the other. He wants to give us of his love, of eternal life, of everything good, but he isn't trying to get anything from us. So Paul now, to these early Christians who were Christians and had been Jews, he gets to talking about this law. And uh, we've been covering the first five chapters of Romans, and and now I'll go on over to beginning the sixth chapter, because that gives you a little bit of summary up to this point. So Paul continues, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's showing that grace is an undeserved pardon and an undeserved gift. It really is twofold. One, uh, grace means that you are pardoned from your past guilt that hangs over you for breaking God's law, but it also is something else. God not only forgives that, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And grace means having God's Spirit by grace as well as the forgiveness of sins as a result of grace. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, there were some preaching, and it was a doctrine of the Nicolaitans, that uh, since it showed how great and loving and kind God is because he, through the blood of Christ, would forgive our sins, and that showed the greatness and the glory of God, therefore, the more God had to forgive, the greater it made God. And so to make God greater, they said... uh, Let's go on and sin more, and then ask him to forgive it, and that makes God greater. So they actually had what they called temple prostitutes back in those days. And uh, uh, many times uh, some of us have gone past the, uh, oh, what is that little small temple uh, uh, in Rome, which was uh, really uh, a temple too, the temple prostitutes that they had actually in the temple of worship. And uh, they just went into every wrong kind of sex and everything that way, feeling that that made God greater because he, uh, the greater their sin, the greater is God's glory in, in forgiving all of that sin. Now, Paul is trying to show that uh, that is just a lot of foolishness. It's not true at all. What do we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we sin more to make God greater? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, if we have the Holy Spirit, we only have the Holy Spirit because we have repented of sinning. Not only of sin, which we have done, but we have repented of sinning, which means we have repented of continuing in it, and we don't live in it any longer. We've turned away from it. And if we've turned away from it, we're dead to it. In other words, uh, we don't do it anymore. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, he goes on to explain it. Water baptism explains that. Know ye not that as many who were baptized into his death, therefore... We are buried with him by baptism. You see, going down into the water is like being buried into death, under the water. And if if you don't come up, you will drown and be dead. Anyone who stays under the water and doesn't come up, the minute you begin to try to breathe, you'll strangle and you'll drown. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, going down into the water, into death that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also 
should walk in newness of life. Now then, coming back up out of the water in the form of baptism means a type of the resurrection of Christ, and we're coming up. It means that we go down, we die the old self. We bury all of our sinful life and the way we've been living and leave it there. Then we come up to live a new and a better and a different kind of life. Now, that's the meaning of water baptism. And that ought to be explained probably a little more than maybe some of our ministers explain it, too. For if we have been planted together, like going down into the water, you're planted in it, in the likeness of his death, which is a type of the death of Christ, and it is a symbol of the death of our old way of living, planted together in the likeness of Christ's death, we shall uh, be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, by coming up out of the water, we come up to live a different kind of life, and uh, just like he came to a new kind of life, spirit life, by his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, that is, the kind of man or the kind of woman that we were and the way we lived, is crucified with him. In other words, uh, we, we crucify that way of living, so to speak. We just don't do it anymore. We've repented of it. Repentance means we've turned around to go the other way. That the body of sin might be destroyed, we don't do it anymore, that henceforth we should not serve sin, because we come up to live according to the law of God. Now, the law of God, as I say, is just love. It is giving and not getting. It is the way of living according to God's law, which is summed up by the Ten Commandments. It is the way of giving, serving, helping, and all of that, and not the way of coveting, of trying to see how much we can get, and how much we can get the better deal of everybody, and uh, which is really the main key of life of the average person in the world today, is getting. They live by that law of getting. They want to get the best of everything, the best of other people. They're not interested in giving. The average person, if he would see someone drop something worth an awful lot of money. Now, it might be uh, some stock or a cashier's check that was already signed and endorsed or something. Now, it might be uh, trucks that the banks use, uh, an armored truck uh, carrying money from one bank to another. And he turned it in. And that man had to move out of his neighborhood because everybody was angry at him because he had been honest to turn it in. They said, you fool, why didn't you keep it? That's the way people are. And that's what we are supposed to bury when we go down under the water in baptism. And we're not ready to be baptized until we're ready to do that. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That is, if you're dead to sin, you don't do it anymore. That part of it, the doing of that is dead. Anyway, you're not dead, but that part of your life, then you are freed from sin. You see, sin often is a matter of habit, and, and if you're its prisoner, and uh, it is your boss. You get into a habit, and uh, boy, it's got you. Now, perhaps one of the least of sins is smoking. But a person who smokes is a slave to that cigarette. They can't quit it. Now, of course, they don't admit that. They say, oh, well, I can quit any time. But I don't want to quit. I like it, and so I want to stay on. Well, that's even worse. But uh, a lot of times, it's like the man that says, I did uh, swear off. I did quit smoking. As a matter of fact, I quit about uh, 40 times every day. And every time he took a cigarette, he'd quit and throw it away. But then five minutes later, he'd pick up another one, or maybe two minutes later. And then he had to quit and throw that one away. And that's the way humans look at it. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead to his resurrection, dieth no more. Now, you see, he's, he's giving an analogy here. 
Christ can never die again. God can't die. And it was a great miracle that uh, Christ is called the Word and was God before he was born of the Virgin Mary, yet he gave that up to become a human being so he could die. And as a human being, he died. But God raised him from the dead in the resurrection. And now he is holy and mortal and spirit again, and now he cannot ever die again. Well, once we have left everything that is wrong behind us, we should never go back to it again. The man that swore off 20 times a day, or 40 times a day, I guess there'd be two packs of cigarettes, would be 40 cigarettes. He went back to it every time he died to it. But uh, if you really die, you can't die again. So he didn't really die to it or, or swear off after all. Christ will die no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. Well, that's the way with us. Likewise, Reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That is, you, you quit doing it, and that doing is dead. The doing of sin, the thinking of sin, the wanting of whatever it is that was sin is dead. And alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Now reign means to rule over you. And uh, sin becomes habit. And people that have such a habit are the slaves of it. And it is ruling them. And, you know, I, I would hate to think that uh, a little cigarette just made me its slave and it had dominion over me. I uh, would like to think that my mind is a little stronger than that. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness under sin, because that's what people do. Now, of course, I just mentioned what certainly is one of the least of the sins, and uh, I, I think that there are degrees of sin. The Bible doesn't just say so out and out directly. But I know this, that men who sinned back in the old days of the Old Testament and that were men of God and who had more wives than they should have had, and, and even had concubines and other women, but their heart was otherwise right with God, God overlooked to some extent. Now, God said to David one time that you have had many wives and concubines, and he said, I would have given you even more if that had been good for you. But the thing that God held against David, it wasn't so much when... He had Bathsheba brought to him and committed adultery with her. He was under a great temptation. It was a weakness. It wasn't a deliberate thinking, you know, a rebellion against God or some deliberate wrong. It wasn't that. It was just a weakness that he gave in to. But then, what... He probably would have called a weakness, but I don't think God did. In order to get rid of it and save himself, he had the husband of that woman killed so that now he could legally marry her and make it all right because she was going to have a child. And he was the king, and uh, if the people found out that he'd committed adultery and had a child as a result of adultery, that would have gone very much against David as king with all of the people. And so he had this man killed. That was his worst sin. That was a premeditated thing and not just a giving in to a weakness. And you'll notice that when the Bible throws that up, it doesn't throw up the adultery part of it, which was bad enough, but it throws up the murder part of it, which was worse. And... I think that Solomon remained all right with God when he first began to take some extra women on after he became king. 
But finally, Solomon had a thousand women. He had 300 wives and 700 concubines. And uh, even then, what God blamed him for and what turned his heart away was they got him to serving their idol gods and deserting the true God. And therefore, he was disloyal to God. Now, there's an example in the 17th chapter of Ezekiel of a colony that had been left in uh, Jerusalem. I don't know if that was this same colony or not. I think this was another colony 70 years earlier that had been a very small colony. And uh, they had made a solemn agreement with the king of Babylon who had conquered Judah and taken all but this little colony away and left one of their own members there as a, a local governor of the colony. Then when the king of Babylon was looking, they made a compact and agreement with the king of Egypt, and they double-crossed the king of Babylon. And God held them severely accountable for that. That kind of thing God won't stand for. Now, do you know the United States has just got through doing that within the last year or so? We made a solemn agreement with nationalist China, Chiang Kai-shek's China. And we double-crossed them and made an agreement with communist China. Now, that was wrong. Now, someone said, well, then why did you go into communist China as a friend? Well, I have nothing to do with that one way or the other. I'm not in politics, but I deplore the fact that the United States double-crossed nationalist China. And God is going to hold this nation accountable. The whole nation is going to be punished for that. And all of us here are going to suffer. Because when the whole nation is punished, as God is going to punish it, that's going to bring punishment and harm to every one of us. And when it happens, remember this little afternoon we were sitting here and how I told you. Just remember, I said to the vice chairman, one of the two vice chairmen, uh, the, one of the three men at the very top of China, over one billion people, I told him what was going to happen, and I told him that uh, I said an unseen hand, but he knew what I mean. He knew, uh, he, he knew I meant God. And I said, uh, you won't believe me now. I don't expect you to believe me. But my job is to tell you, and I have told you. And I said, when it happened, you remember I told you. Well, I acquitted myself just by telling him. And uh, there's nothing else I can do. I can't conquer a whole nation that's a fourth of all of the people on earth, as China is. Now, Neither you nor do you remember as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but uh, yield yourselves unto God. Now, not part of your body, you know, but your whole body and mind, your whole self, as those that are alive from the dead, and uh, your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, there are a lot of people say, that means, oh, you don't have to obey the law anymore, that you either have law or grace. It's one or the other. Now, if you are going to have law, and they say that you're trying to let your goodness of obeying law save you, and others, and most churches today will say, but we're under grace, not under law. Now, under the law doesn't mean under obligation to obey the law. You're not under the law if you're obeying the law. You're not under it. You're under the law when you broke it. Because if you break it, the law has a penalty. And the penalty is over you, and you are under it. You're not under the law until you break it. And they don't understand that. What then? Shall we sin, which means to break the law, because sin is the transgression of the law, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments here. You have to understand that Paul talks about two different kinds and codes of law altogether in Romans and Galatians. 
And sometimes he's talking about the works of the law, which means uh, the ergon is the Greek word, which means the physical law. But here he's talking about the Ten Commandments, the spiritual law. And I'll show you as we go right on into the seventh chapter. What then? Shall we sin, that is, disobey the law and break the law, because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. To them, uh, a lot of them meant, well, then we should break the law. No, it doesn't mean anything of the kind. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. You yield yourselves to do something that is contrary to God's law, or even the principle of it. And you become the servant or the slave of whatever that is, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, and as long as they sinned and committed sin, transgressing God's spiritual law, they were the servants of sin, the servants of transgression, not the servants of the law. Now, if the law is over you, that means that you're servants of the law. But it doesn't, Paul isn't teaching that you're a servant of the law because the law is over you, like a Lord Master is over you by ruling you. What is over you is sin, which is the breaking of the law, the transgression of the law. God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, not servants of the law, but servants of breaking the law. But you have obeyed, I mean obeying the law, from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And that was the keeping of the commandments, of course. Being then made free from sin, not free from having to obey the law, but free from having to uh, being willing to transgress the law, you become the servants of uh, righteousness, or right doing, or keeping of the law. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members, servants, to uh, uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, that is, the parts of your body, meaning your mind as well as her, uh, your arms or legs or any part of your body, even so now yield your members, servants, to uh, righteousness under holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, again, they were servants, sin is the transgression of the law. They were the servants of transgressing the law. You were free from righteousness. They were free from right doing. You know, we have people that have been in the church and gone out. There was one girl, an English girl, who came into the church, and so she came to Pasadena, and I think she graduated from Ambassador College. And then she married one of our American men from Oregon. And uh, finally she turned all embittered and went out of the church. And uh, they had moved to Omaha where her husband had been made pastor. And she said, thank God, she says that I'm out from under all that... Uh, government of God. I don't want to be under the government of God. Well, that's the way people talk who don't want to be under obligation to obey God's law and to do what is right. They want to be free to do what is wrong. And they call that freedom. Free to do what is wrong. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. And that's the way a lot of people want to be, free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? They're ashamed of having done those things now. So what, what good, what did it produce? What fruit? What benefit for doing the things you're now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. 
the objective or where it leads to. But now, being made free from sin, not free to sin, and not free uh, from obedience to the law, but free from transgressing the law, and become the servants to God, you have your fruit under holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. You're not an immortal soul. That is the scripture that distorted me to understanding that what I'd been taught as a boy in Sunday school was all wrong. I said, well, how can that be? The wages of sin is death. Wages is what you get paid for what you do. And uh, here it says that what you do is sin, and the wages you get paid for doing it then is death. And I said, well, no, I was taught it's eternal life, but of course it's eternal life and hell fire, but nevertheless you'd go on living, even though you were being burned up all the time and had never burned up. And then the last part of this sentence is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and you know, that uh, didn't make any more sense to me, because I, if I was an immortal soul... I didn't need eternal life as a gift. I didn't have to have it given to me when I already had it. If someone would say, I give you this particular watch and I've already got it, I don't have to have you give it to me. It's right here. I've already got it. And so that didn't make sense to me. Then I had to find out that it was my teaching that had been wrong. I was not an immortal soul at all. I was mortal so that I would die, and death is the penalty of sin. Now, is it too late? Have I taken up too much time on that to go right on? We didn't get started at 2.30, did we? Well, I'm not too tired if you're not. Now, this seventh chapter is quite important. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But now that again is from the, uh, not uh, necessarily uh, technically one of the Ten Commandments, but it is based on the Ten Commandments. And uh, it is, is part of the statutes and judgments that were given Israel for the law of their nation, but it was all based on laws that only carried out the principle of the Ten Commandments, and that's what this does. Because the, the very commandment about adultery shows that it, it gets into the, the Ten Commandments, actually get into the marriage situation. For the woman that has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she uh, be married to another man. In other words, if uh, a woman's husband dies, she is perfectly free to marry another man. If a man's wife dies, he's perfectly free to marry another woman. And uh, so it goes. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law, that is, you're, you're dead to breaking the law, as I explained in the chapter before, by the body of Christ, that uh, you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. In other words, instead of sin, now you're married to Christ, instead of being sort of, as you say, he's using another analogy here. In other words, you were married to breaking the law. It was your master. You're like a woman, and the husband is over the wife in God's law. And uh, 
Now you're married to another even Christ. And we who are in the church, even though we're men, are part of the church that will be married to Christ, and there we begin to take the part of the woman collectively, you see, to be married to Christ at his second coming, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, that is, carnal-minded, and uh, our minds were on the flesh, the motions of sins, which is transgressing the law, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death, because they brought forth transgression, and the wages of sin is death. And it means a second death, too, as other scriptures show. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, and we were held as slaves, because we were breaking the law. You can see how Paul writes here and how people, seeing just the one part of it and not taking it all together, can get it twisted. For uh, now we are delivered from the law. They just take that one thing by itself and they were delivered from having to keep the law. We don't need to keep it anymore. And that, if you read the whole thing, is not what Paul's talking about here at all. Unless he says in one verse you do not have to keep the law at all in the next verse, but you do have to keep the law. And Paul isn't quite that crazy. We're dead from the law, that being dead wherein we were held as slaves to breaking the law, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, in the New Testament, in the third chapter, of uh, Second Corinthians, we find that Paul says that Christians must live according to the spirit of the law and not the letter. And the spirit of the law means the obvious intent and what it means, and not uh, the strict letter. And I have an illustration I used to use in sermons about that when. My elder daughter, Beverly, was, uh, I think, in junior high. She always was uh, an inveterate bookworm. She was reading books all the time, but she was always trying to read fiction, and especially uh, she was just fond of love stories. And uh, uh, from the school library, she would always borrow books and bring them home, and inside of two evenings, she would read a whole book. She was a rapid reader. And uh, she got that from her mother. She didn't get it from me because I'm a very slow reader. Well, I got a note one time from her teacher, and the teacher said that Beverly was ruining her eyes by reading too much and uh, that she had checked up and found that Beverly was bringing books home from the library and reading a lot of fiction that just, it was a ready-made daydream, and uh, the teacher asked if I wouldn't speak to her about it because it was injuring her schoolwork or retarding it. And so I talked to her and told her I had this note from her teacher, and I said, Now, Beverly, uh, you must not bring any more of those books home. You've just got to stop that kind of reading. And, uh, well, she said, Well, all right, Daddy. And the very next night, I saw her reading, and I looked, and and she was right in the middle of a book. She'd read about half of it. I said, well, Beverly, uh, can I see that book? And I looked at it, and there was another book of fiction. And I said, I thought I told you not not to read these books anymore. She says, well, Daddy, I did obey you. You said, don't bring any more of those books home from the library, and I borrowed this book from Helen. I didn't get it at the library. She obeyed the letter of the law. But she didn't obey its real intent, because she knew that what I meant was don't read those books anymore, any kind of books like that, unless it's the kind of books that are a lesson assigned you that you're studying. That's the different kind of reading. So uh, 
That's exactly what is meant by between the letter and the spirit. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Now, that's what they want to say. The law itself is wrong. The law is sin. No, he says, God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin but by the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law, and if the law didn't tell us what is wrong, we wouldn't know what is wrong, would we? I have not known sin but by the law, for I have not known lust. That is, he didn't know that coveting or lust is wrong, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, what law says, Thou shalt not covet? I told you he's talking about the Ten Commandments. He isn't talking here about the ritual law like he is through most of the book of Galatians. The Ten Commandments, the Tenth Command is, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, for I was alive without the law once. That is, I was living, but I was living in sin. That's what he means. Because he didn't know that some of these things were wrong until the law told him it was wrong. But when the commandment came, now that told him what sin was. So he says, sin revived, and I died. Because he repented and, and uh, quit disobeying the law once the knowledge came to him. The knowledge has to come to you first. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, because it's the right way to live, and the way of peace, and the way of happiness, the way of achievement, the way of success, the way of everything good, and the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, because he was disobeying it. And yet it's supposed if we obey it, it uh, is the way to live, uh, to be happy. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy. They don't read this verse. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Romans seven twelve. That's the one verse I had to memorize and know just what it is and where it is. And then Romans 7, 14 is another that we're coming to on just two more verses. Was then that which is good, which is the law of love, God's law, was it made death unto me? God forbid. For sin, that it might appear to be sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Because now you can see that the law said that's wrong, and now it, it, it became really wrong. He didn't really know it before. For we know, now this is the 14th verse I told you, the law is spiritual. Now I have that one marked. Now those are two verses that I always want marked. The law is holy and just and good in verse 10 and in verse 12. The law is a spiritual law. Now, you see, the works of the law are a physical law, the ritualistic law. But he's talking about a spiritual law, the Ten Commandments. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal as a human, a normal human being without God's Holy Spirit, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, because in his mind he sees now uh, by the commandment uh, that this and that and the other thing is wrong, and the commandment only gives us the principle of the law, or by the spirit of the law, and not the letter. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, and what he would do is to obey the law. In his mind he sees that's what he ought to do, and that's what he wants to do. But what I hate, that I do. Now he finds that he isn't always doing what he sees he ought to do and what he really wants to do. If then I do that which I would not, and which I don't really want to do because I see it's wrong, but I'm doing it, I consent under the law that it, the law, is good. 
Now, then, it is no more I that do it, because with my mind I want to do what is right in God's sight, but it is sin that dwelleth in me. You see, habit gets into our bodies and in our minds until it, it has us do what we've seen we ought to turn away from, and we don't always do it. It's the struggle that everyone has when they try to repent and come out of sinning and do what is right. And nobody is living perfectly. No Christian is living perfectly. They just don't. There's only one who ever did, and that was Jesus Christ. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, and I, I say it's wrong, and yet I find I'm doing it. Now, if I do what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, it's, it's, it's just gotten in us as a matter of habit. And But you see, that's where the Christian life has to become a life of overcoming, and you don't do it all at once. You have to struggle with it until you finally do get it done. I find a law of them that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God. He wasn't against the law. He wasn't telling you the law itself is wrong. He said, I delight in the law. He's talking about the spiritual law, the law that is holy and just and good. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, in his mind and in his body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He can't do it himself and by himself. Now he's coming to show us that the only way we can do it is through the power that God will give us through the Holy Spirit. Now he's coming right into the 8th chapter, and the 8th chapter is the Holy Spirit chapter of the Bible. I think there, there must be a mistranslation here, but the uh, Revised Standard doesn't uh, make it any better. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I guess that's the answer, but I don't think it's properly translated. In other words, that he thanks God, that God is the one who can deliver him through the power of the Holy Spirit. He can't deliver himself. It's impossible for anyone to keep the spiritual law perfectly according to the Spirit and keep it perfectly. Now you read that uh, uh, the parents of John the Baptist were uh, keeping the law perfectly, but that was according to the letter in the Old Testament and referring uh, pretty much to the physical law anyway. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. And he means to obey it. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, I think we need to read just a little bit in the eighth chapter. It's a long chapter, and I won't go on through it, but I think we have to make sense there, we need a little bit more. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now you see here, the law of the Spirit of life, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, what he couldn't do, wretched man that I am, how can I, uh, I'm not doing what I want to do and what I uh, see is right. Now he's showing that, that Christ himself, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has delivered him. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now I think there he is referring to the law of rituals, which couldn't make him righteous. Or even the keeping of the Ten Commandments can't make you righteous. I mean, the Ten Commandments can't make you righteous of itself. It, it love is the fulfilling of the law, but it takes the love of God by the Holy Spirit to do it. We don't have the kind of love that will do it. But God will give us his Holy Spirit, 
any time we want to surrender and turn around to go the other way and believe and accept Christ. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of flesh and uh, for sin, condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness or right doing of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, that is, the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're led by the Holy Spirit, we're walking after it. The Holy Spirit, I believe that the first thing the Holy Spirit does is to open our minds to understand the spiritual truth of the Bible. Now, I've got a lot of books over there on the shelf that are commentaries that go right through every verse almost in the Bible and try to explain it. And they're all written by scholarly men, men of fine minds, men that are great students and scholars, but they don't know bugs about the Bible. Because they just... uh, I know when I read through those commentaries a little while, they were written by men who don't have the Holy Spirit of God and are devoid of real understanding. For they that are after the flesh, that is, that are following the flesh, and so they're following it, they're after it, and it's ahead of them, uh, do mind uh, or obey the things of the flesh. For they that are after the Spirit, that is, being led by the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Then he comes on down, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, in verse 9, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That's the definition of a Christian. A Christian, then, is one who has the Holy Spirit of God. And he's showing that the law is spiritual and we are carnal. And we have to have the Holy Spirit to give us a spiritual love in order that we can uh, keep the spiritual law that God's standing there ready to give it to us any time we want to surrender to it and believe. And that's all there is to that. You know, if you don't mind a little more, I would like to read part of what uh, I had written yesterday. This is just part of the book I'm writing on The Voice Speaks Out. And uh, this is the part... In the chapter where uh, is answering who and what is God? What is God? And who is God? I say that there's no church and no religion on earth that knows who and what is God, but the one church of God that is the persecuted little church in our day called the Worldwide Church of God. Now, I have been explaining, uh, I don't have a preceding page here, that it said that uh, how God is composed of spirit, uh, describing who and what God is. And I have already explained how there were the two, one called the Word and the other called God, and yet the Word is also God, and all of that, that they were the two persons that originally formed God in the beginning of what will become the family of God, and he is now, because we are the children of God, if we have the Holy Spirit. And later in this eighth chapter of Romans, it shows that. If the Spirit of God dwells in us, we are now the children of God, begotten but not yet born. And uh, how God was composed of spirit, not composed of matter like man. Spirit is invisible to uh, human eyes, unless by some special process manifested. And if so manifested, and uh, we could see God the Father, or Christ as he now is, glorified in heaven, we would see that his face, though formed and shaped as is that of a man, would shine as bright as the sun in full strength. His eyes would appear as flames of fire. Flames shooting out, the fire. His feet like burnished glass, and uh, the hair on his head white as snow. That's from Revelation 1, verses 14 to 16. But, most important of all, 
what is God's nature? What is his character like, if you're going to know who and what is God? I don't believe you can know who and what is God if you don't know something of his character and his nature. His character is that of righteous, holy perfection. It is his way of life. It might be summed up in the one word, love, defined as an outgoing, loving concern, the way of giving, of sharing, of serving, of cooperating in that which is right and good, of helping. It is uh, the way devoid of lust, greed, coveting, vanity, self-centeredness, competition, strife, or violence, of envy or jealousy, or of uh, rebellion or resentment of authority. Uh, it is devoid of these uh, attributes of Satan uh, that we call human nature. God's inherent nature is the way of peace, of happiness, of justice, the way that produces peace, happiness, joy, and every good. And God's purpose is to create such character within certain of his created living beings. I said certain, as I, uh, I will describe that as I go on. In other words, uh, he's created plants and all kinds of animals and so on. He isn't trying to create that in them. Greatest creation achievements, the subhead. Who and what is God? In one word, God is creator. Now, before I said one word, he is love, but he is creator. But God has created many things, the stars and planets, the galaxies in endless space, the earth and all in it. He has created angels. On earth, he has created man, animals, birds, fowl, fish, even insects. But what? in God's mind, is of the greatest importance. We can't tell what God is unless we know what he is creating, his supreme creation. Most important is to create his very own perfect, godly, holy, and righteous character within separate entities of his creation. He creates the separate entities and then to create his own holy, righteous, perfect character within those entities. Now, that is the greatest thing that God can do. And when he gets that done, and humans, he will have reproduced himself. And there will be like him, and, and he can't produce something higher than himself. Because there isn't anything, it isn't possible that anything could be higher than himself. This creation of character within living beings requires the presence of mind in those beings. Now, this is right along the line of what we've just been reading there today. Of all living beings and things God has created, only angels and humans have minds. And therefore, it is so far only in angels and humans that God's character may be formed. On earth, God has created the flora, plant forms of life, plants, grass, flowers, fruits, reproduce themselves and have life, but uh, not brain or the possibility of character development. Animal forms, the fauna, have brains, but apart from humans, they do not have minds. There is not in them the same self-consciousness and thinking, reasoning ability that is in man, in humans. Therefore, only humans of all life forms created out of matter on earth. Now, that the angel were created out of spirit, you see. Created out of matter on earth have the potential of having uh, created within them 
God's perfect and holy character. That's what Paul has just been talking about in that uh, sixth and seventh chapter of Romans. It follows, then, that God's purpose in uh, the creation of the fauna and flora other than man is primarily for the benefit of man. Otherwise, what good are they? He's not creating character in them. Much of the flora and some of the fauna serves as food for man. Some is for food of uh, other fauna. In other words, uh, uh, wild animals live on uh, other smaller animals, or um, oh, not always smaller either. Some is for human enjoyment and beauty, like the flowers and things like that. And, of course, God created minds in animals, so it devolves down to the fact that uh, the separate entities which God created with power of character development and installation uh, are two, angels and man. It can't be animals because they don't have the minds that are capable of developing character. Now, character development in angels. Angels are composed wholly of spirit. Well, I don't know. I think what I just read is what I had in mind. I don't think the rest of it ties in with what our lesson was today. I just thought that might be interesting that will be in the book because Paul didn't state it in that language that uh, God's purpose is development of character. Now, you see what Paul was explaining there is that we wouldn't know what sin is except that the law tells us. Now we have the Bible in writing and printing today, and uh, and we can read. Animals can't, and animals don't know. They don't have minds. Well, what is all of this for? You see, the... Uh, well, no, I think there is a little more here that I want to read to you. I, let me just skip a part of it and come to something that I think that will have bearing on this. Well, I don't think it would do any harm to read it if you can bear another five minutes. Angels are composed wholly of spirit. God created them with minds. Apparently, a third of the angels were placed on the earth from its creation. In uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 4, we read of the angels that sinned, implying, as do other scriptures, that uh, there were angels who did not sin. In uh, Revelation 12, verse 4, is the implication that one-third of the angels followed Satan and uh, were cast to the earth. The other two-thirds, the holy angels, will follow Jesus at his uh, second coming to earth, Matthew 25, verse 31. The angels placed on earth from its creation, were governed by the government of God. On uh, the throne of the whole earth to rule and administer that government was a super archangel named Lucifer. He was the supreme masterpiece of God's creation as a uh, super angel being. But there was one most important thing that even the great God could not create automatically by fiat, a holy and righteous character. Now, the duality in creation. But there is a duality in almost everything God creates, just as there was the duality of God in the beginning of God and the Word. He creates, especially in regard to character, in two stages, not all at once, in two stages. I am reminded, in explaining this, of unpainted uh, or raw uh, furniture. Most cities have a retail store selling furniture in the raw, uh, quote and unquote. It may be very fine furniture of excellent quality, but uh, it is unfinished. The varnish, polish, or paint has not been put on to finish it. 
God created this earth in an unfinished state, intending the angels to finish it, thus sharing in God's creation. They were uh, put here to work the earth and uh, its components, chemical and physical, developing it, beautifying it, putting on the finishing touches. The earth was perfect as God uh, first created it, as far as God went, but he hadn't completely finished it. And he didn't intend to do that finishing himself. He intended for his created beings, the angels, to do the finishing. But uh, up to that, everything God did was perfect. But he left it to the angels to put on the finishing touches so that they would uh, work harmoniously together. God placed over them his government with Lucifer on the throne of all the earth. But Lucifer allowed jealousy, envy, rebellion against God and uh, the authority of God over him to fill his mind. Then he became uh, puffed up with vanity, wanting to exalt himself above God. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15, and Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17. Lucifer had been perfect in all of his ways from the day that God created him till lawlessness was found in him, Ezekiel 28, verse 15. By his colossal sins, he became Satan, the devil, and led his angels into his rebellion, and they became demons. Now, duality in character creation. This same duality principle works in the creation of character as God uh, intended in angels and as he is uh, creating in man. This righteousness and perfect character is something God alone cannot create instantly uh, by fiat. First, he created the angels endowed them with minds, and uh, endowed also with uh, free moral agency, that is, ability to exercise free choice, to think, to reason, to come to uh, conclusions, to make uh, decisions as to character development. Lucifer had been uh, on the uh, very throne of God in heaven, uh, seat of the universe rule, Ezekiel uh, 28, verse 14. He had been thoroughly instructed and uh, trained in the administration of uh, the government of God. He had been given uh, the knowledge of the right way. Now, at this juncture, define uh, righteous and perfect character. What is character? What do I mean about it? It is the ability of a separate entity having power of mind and free moral agency, ability to think, reason, make decisions, and to act on one's decisions, to come to knowledge of the right as opposed to the wrong, to will to do the right, even against desires or pulls to do the wrong. That's what Paul was talking about all the way there, against the pulls within you to do the wrong, you see. And finally, to overcome pulls toward the wrong and to do the right.